Good afternoon, dear colleagues, and a very warm welcome to this joint Libre and Knowledge Rights 21 webinar entitled Harmonizing Zero Embargo Initiatives, Challenges in Europe and Beyond. My name is Martina Pronk, Executive Director of Libre, Europe's largest network organization for research libraries, and I am going to be your host today. Before I start the introduction, I would kindly like to invite all participants to this webinar to share in the chat your affiliation and where you're calling in from, uh, just to see where you're all at. Today, we will treat you with the, um, uh, to the expert insights and opinions of our four esteemed speakers from Europe and the US. A warm welcome to Matthias Bjornman, Secretary General at Cesar, Christina Angelopoulos, Associate Professor in Intellectual Property Law at University of Cambridge, Robert Kiley, Head of Strategy at Coalition S, and Judy Rottenberg, Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries in the United States. This event builds on KR21's research on secondary publishing rights driven by Lieber that resulted in the report Secondary Publishing Rights in Europe status, challenges, and opportunities that was published in October this year. It further complements our previous KR21 webinar on enabling the reuse of the scholarly publication. For those of you who were not able to read the report on secondary publishing rights in Europe, I would like to give a brief introduction to the key conclusions of the report. The secondary publishing right is considered to be one of the key instruments that can open the road to green open access by challenging and lifting the contractual barriers between publishers and authors around the deposition of post-print or version of records in public not-for-profit repositories. The SPR should be considered as a secure legislative measure that coexists with others, such as policies of rights retention, for lifting restrictions and enabling publicly funded re research to become open access. Such a republishing right has been introduced in seven European countries. While these often allow for a gap between initial publication and reposting, widely known as an embargo, there's an apparent tendency now towards a zero embargo approach, consistent with calls by European Union ministers for immediate open access. The key conclusions of the report are as follows. Firstly, there's a great heterogeneity among the seven countries. SPR provisions vary when it comes to their stated goals and legal context, but also have different components that affect their implementation. Secondly, these provisions have been introduced in ways that have not always taken into account the voice of relevant stakeholders. It also appears that the importance ascribed to such policies by governments seem relatively low, despite the contribution that they can make to achieving open access goals. Thirdly, expert guidance and support are vital to respond to challenges during the drafting and negotiation of the law. Skills must be developed and capitalized on at the implementation stage to make SPR effective. Furthermore, the disharmony of various legislative acts and jurisdictions confuses and affects the implementation of SPR. Resources and policy instruments are vital to monitor compliance with the law and provide informed feedback. And lastly, while the adoption of SPR in individual countries is welcomed, the widest possible adoption at a harmonized EU level is the most plausible solution to address national and international differences. Now, the link to the report will be shared in the chat. Following on these key findings today, during the webinar, we take a deep dive into the prospect of a zero embargo model by exploring initiatives and barriers to harmonize secondary publishing rights legislation. We will examine how us SPR legislation can go from a national to an international level so that publicly funded research output will be shared openly and without any embargo period. And lastly, we will provide insights on how SPR can enable the immediate access to research findings, the course of action needed to get there, 
and identify which stakeholders must act. Now we will start with the presentations of our four speakers, team 10 minutes each, which lasts us at the end with about 40 minutes of panel discussions. If you have any questions during the presentations of our speakers or during the panel discussion, please put them in the chat. We're monitoring the conversation and we will have time to answer questions at the end for the second half of the webinar. If you want to ask someone specific, please indicate who you would like to answer. Now, before we start, as you're used to, some final household rules with which you probably are familiar, but nevertheless, I would kindly like to ask you to turn your camera and microphone off to not distract or interrupt the speakers. And please mind that this is a recorded session. The webinar is recorded for future dissemination as was stated in the event page. And also for this reason, we prefer cameras off. And a third household um, uh, message that Matthias needs to leave us at 5.30, so we will try and save the first questions in the panel discussion for him. Now, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce to you our first speaker today, Matthias Björnman. Matthias is an experienced scientist and policy professional. As of the 1st of January, he serves as Secretary General of CESAR, the strong and united force of universities of science and technology. Matthias will take the perspective from universities and research performing organizations and will inform us on retention of rights for researchers at universities of science and technology and beyond. Now, before uh, Matthias uh, starts, I would like to ask all speakers, please, to turn your camera off. And um, Matthias, the floor is yours. Good afternoon from my side, and thank you very much, Martine. And good morning to those of you joining from the other side of the Atlantic from other parts of the world. Dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today as the Secretary General of CSAR. Our association has been an active promoter of open science in general and open access in particular for many years. First, uh, one or two minutes to give you a little bit about uh, us as an association and, and who we are and where we're coming from. We're a nonprofit. CSER is a nonprofit founded over 30 years ago. 58 member universities in Europe and beyond, both technical universities and comprehensive universities with a strong focus on science and technology. What makes us a little bit uh, special here is that we're a so-called acknowledged stakeholder organization uh, working closely with many EU institutions, such as the European Commission, Parliament and the Council. Our members, so these are our 58 members from 28 countries, and you are, some of you have already seen are from some of these institutions here, so warm welcome also to you, of course. And we're proud that our newest member, number 58, is the National Technical University of Ukraine uh, from Kiev, which joined earlier this year. Caesar's position on the rights retention. So over the last few years, we have developed a very strong position uh, in this area. This includes uh, the rights retention strategies and, and similar, which is of course our topic today. I will touch upon briefly what our association has done in relation to two key players that we see, so governments and the publishers. Of course, we also have an internal dimension here, what is happening inside universities together with our researchers and research communities. And I'm happy to elaborate on this further afterwards as well, if there is interest or questions on this. In the end, I will conclude with uh, some next steps here and two key messages from my side. First, for governments, we had a clear position in 2020 when the rules for Horizon Europe, so this is the main EU funding program for research and innovation were being developed. You can see the three key messages on the screen here. On one hand, we welcome the ongoing efforts across Europe around copyright laws with open access amendments. We strongly encouraged for the deployment of EU member states, and we called for EU legislation to give researchers the non-waivable legal right to share publicly funded and peer-reviewed research findings without embargoes. The objective here, or the, pos the, po the positive of 
pursuing such an EU level legal solution would be that this would solve the problem, quote unquote, for everyone uh, directly. Publishers, researchers, and the universities would not need to act further if it was clarified on this legal level that researchers have a non waivable legal right. We could all just focus on research, was basically the position that we took. However, of course, a key obstacle with this approach is that new legislation may take many years from conception to implementation. So in addition, we also work directly with publishers on this topic from the perspective of universities. I want to be clear up front here that there are many excellent and modern publishers out there that for a long time already have been respecting researchers' rights and working with researchers and research communities on this. But we also know that for some publishers, it is still standard procedure to ask authors to sign away their rights as a default step in their publication process. In 2021, our association, together with our friends in the European University Association and Science Europe, uh, Science Europe being an organization of research funders and some other organizations, therefore published a joint statement you can see on screen here, where we called upon all publishers to ensure they fully respect researchers' rights in this area. The positive side of this approach is that it's seamless from the perspective of researchers and universities. We know this from examples already today where researchers engage with those publishers that do respect the rights in this way. So if all publishers follow this path, then the problem would indeed be solved without further action needed. However, the drawback here is that we are now largely out of what we can call the awareness raising phase. This is many of the publishers who have not modernized and followed these proceedings yet have made a conscious decision not to do so. Some publishers may, for example, think that having researchers sign away their rights in these ways can help boost sales of their products or in other ways provide a financial advantage. This avenue can therefore be seen as largely stuck for now, but happy to be entering discussion on this later and be proven wrong if there are movements that we see. We have a window of opportunity here, connecting to, as Martin also introduced, the movements that we've seen at the European level. This is what is called council conclusions that were adopted on the 23rd of May, 2023. Uh, as they were being negotiated, CSR, so the association published this contribution at the beginning of May, so a few weeks before. You can read it in full on our website, but the first recommendation is visible on screen here which is to enshrine a secondary publishing right at the European level to empower researchers. And we as an association provided our strongest support to the European Commission, so the executive arm of the European Union, to swiftly come forward with a proposal to enshrine such a secondary publishing right in EU law. The interesting part with these so-called council conclusions is that ministers, so those uh, the higher political level of the different member states of the European Union, negotiate and sign off on this. So we have now an opportunity to work with the higher political level as well, following all this technical work that many of you on the call today and in this meeting today have been parts of from all across Europe and beyond to lay the foundation for. For those of you who are a little bit more connected to the policy world in Brussels or the EU institution, it also connects to what is called the second action of a era policy agenda. I'm not going to go into the technical details here, but there's an immediate follow-up ongoing inside the European Commission on this topic. So my position here, and I was very happy to read this knowledge rights report. You can see one of the infographics shared here, and you can, of course, have received the full uh, report and can see it from the, from the chatter as well, is that major policy shifts only happen when the political and the technical levels are aligned, especially when we talk at the EU level. We have now a unique opportunity as we have laid the technical foundation and the legal foundation for many years, and we now have political momentum at the European level since at least May this year. So I want to express my deep gratitude and a thank you to KR21, Lieber, and all partners and all of you here today helping us in pushing for this. And I call on all of us, all participants today, to lend your support in whatever capacity you can here. So my two key takeaway messages from the perspective of CSR, the 58 universities united in our association, is that on one hand, we call on all publishers to fully respect researcher rights. 
meaning in this case that researchers who wish to deposit their manuscript in a repository with an open license without any embargo must be able to do so. And secondly, we have called upon the EU institutions and the European commissions particularly to help enshrine a secondary publishing right at the European level to empower researchers. And we provide our strongest support for the commission to swiftly come forward with such a proposal, which we are seeing being developed and we're seeing that there are movements here. So I am very hopeful in this area. That was all from my side. I think that was around eight minutes or so. So I'm happy I came in slightly under time and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you so much, um, Matthias, for your uh, insight and sharing uh, the ideas and thoughts um, from uh, your side of uh, your perspectives. Um, from the, the site of research performing organizations. And I'm sure we will dive into um, those uh, uh, points of action that you're calling for uh, a little bit later during the panel discussion. Uh, I can imagine there are some questions on this. Um, so please bear with us uh, for the moment. Uh, our second speaker today that I would like to invite is Dr. Christina Angelopoulos. Christina is an associate professor in intellectual Pro property law at the University of Cambridge. And her main research interests lie in copyright and modern technologies, copyright and academic publishing, author and user rights, intermediary liability, and the term of copyright protection and the intersection of IP uh, with tort law and human rights. Christina will share us her knowledge from a legal perspective on copyright and related rights and access to and reuse of scientific publications. Please, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martina. Let me just get the... Um presentation up and running. Uh, can you see that? Um, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, excellent. So, um, yes, good, um, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Martina, for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk in this uh, very interesting and very timely um, uh, workshop. It, it's wonderful to be here and have the opportunity to present. So, like you said, Martina, uh, what I'd like to talk about today is a study I produced last year. This was commissioned by the European Commission, and it has the rather long-winded title that you can see on the screen. Uh, so, it's Copyright and Related Rights and Access to and Reuse of Scientific Publications, including via open access. And uh, like Martina already said, I am a legal researcher, and so the perspective taken in this study was that of legal research. The, uh, the, the, the focus was on reuse and access to scientific publications and the intersection of this objective with copyright law. Now, it ended up being a rather long-winded study, so given the time available, I will focus this uh, presentation on the main highlights. And specifically, I'll confine myself to a discussion of the legislative tools for enabling access to and reuse of scientific publications. The study also considered non-legislative solutions, but I think those aspects will be co covered uh, by Robert's presentation um, uh, after mine in the context of Plan S. So the background to the study um, is, of course, provided by the current um, academic publishing, um, uh, current academic publishing practices. I'm not going to linger on these because I'm sure there's already a very high level of understanding in the room. But in short, most scientific publishers traditionally require or have required an assignment of copyright or an exclusive license in the scientific articles which they publish. And as a lot of funding for scientific research is public, whether that comes from universities who are employing researchers or from third party funders, the ultimate result has been an appropriation, a commodification, as it has been termed, for example, by Roberto Caso and Julia Doré of, um, of, of a public investment into research by private publishers. And this has attracted heavy criticism. 
Now, in this context, the first thing with any uh, the first thing that any uh, that somebody with any understanding of copyright law is going to think about is, of course, exceptions and limitations. What kind of breathing room for the reuse of scientific publications can be granted via exceptions and limitations to copyright law? Now, depending on the circumstances, then uh, a number of exceptions and limitations to copyright may be relevant, may be helpful in helping interest uh, researchers interested in reusing scientific publications in the study, I primarily focused on two of the most obvious ones, which are the exception for the purposes of scientific research, which has been harmonized at the EU level via Article 53A of the Information Society Directive, and the exception for the purposes of quotation, including criticism and review, which has been harmonized at the EU level via um, Article 53D of the Information Society Directive. Now, in relation to the first of these, the first, uh, the the one thing which immediately emerges is that uh, is the issue of scope. The wording of the provision is interesting. According to this, the exception applies under certain conditions to use for the sole purpose of illustration for teaching or scientific research. And as a number of legal commentators have observed, this wording raises the question of whether the word illustration attaches only to teaching or also to scientific research. And the implications are significant because illustration for scientific research research, aside from being a rather counterintuitive and obscure term, would suggest that the protection here is only for a rather special kind of research-related quotation right of a very limited use. Uh, a second issue, no less important, is that uh, as most of the exceptions under Article 5 of the Information Society Directive, the research exception remains entirely optional for the member states. Similar problems can also be found in relation to the quotation exception. Indeed, if anything, the situation here is even more dire. Lionel Bentley and Tanya Aplin have explained in their uh, seminal research that the best interpretation is that the quotation exception is obligatory under the Berne Convention and that under that convention it enjoys a very broad scope. Nevertheless, the Information Society Directive appears to treat the exception as optional and the member states have introduced a wide variety of restrictions to this exception, and the result is what um, Bentley and Aplin have termed a dysfunctional pluralism. Now, the role of fundamental rights in this regard should also be taken into account. In its case law, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the CJU, has emphasized that member states cannot rely on fundamental rights to introduce exceptions and limitations into their legal orders, which are not foreseen by the harmonized acquis. At the same time, however, the Court has emphasized that the member states must ensure that their copyright laws adhere fully to the Charter. Now, the possibility that the closed list of exceptions and limitations that exists within EU copyright law cannot be stretched to accommodate a use which is required by fundamental rights does not appear to be something that the court has contemplated. The result is therefore arguably legal uncertainty. In this regard, commentators have suggested that the court's judgments amount to a judicial challenge to the EU legislator to take action potentially targeted action in certain areas such as scientific research. The CJU has also stipulated that exceptions and limitations confer rights on users, and this is very interesting language. This is particularly interesting because exceptions and limitations are limited to the reuse of copyright protected works. They don't guarantee access. And this is a fact which hasn't gone unnoticed specifically by scientific users. So, for example, in um, the 2014 public consultation on the review of EU copyright rules, end users report a dissatisfaction with the protection which is offered by exceptions and limitations for research activities due to problems not with reuse but with access. And this makes sense because of course the notions of access and reuse are distinct but they are connected. Without access there can be no reuse and without reuse access loses much of its purpose. So this gives rise to the question of how researchers' user rights in relation to scientific articles can be operationalized through the provision of access.
Now, one possible solution which has been debated in recent years and which is, of course, that in which this uh, workshop is targeted. So that is the so-called secondary publication right. This has been adopted over the past decade and to date the following member states, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany and the Netherlands. Um, we have other similar perhaps solutions in other countries as well. Details vary from country to country, but in general, what we're talking about here is an inalienable, non waivable right for authors of publicly funded scientific publications to make their texts freely available to the public without the permission of the copyright owner. Now, the obvious question in this regard is whether a secondary publication right could be adopted at the EU level, and there have in fact been proposals to this effect. There are a few things to consider, however, from a legal perspective in this regard, beginning with the nature of the right. So while it is labelled a right in practice, as, as commentators have pointed out, it behaves a lot like an exception or limitation to copyright. And this means that the three steps test, which is established in international copyright law and European copyright law, might have to be taken into account. Now, applying the three-step test to the secondary publication right is not straightforward. I provide a detailed analysis in the report. Um, for example, however, it seems to me unlikely that the secondary publication right could be used to grant authors rights to make available to the public the version of record. Embargoes are also critical in getting the secondary publication right over the second step of the test. And, and moreover, ideally, if the objective is to avoid this transfer of funds from public funders to private publishers, the payment of equitable remuneration ought to be avoided, but it is sometimes argued that that is necessary in order to pass the third step. Another thing that's very important to keep in mind with regard to the secondary publication right are the rules of uh, private international law. Current national examples make the right mandatory, but this does not mean that it will be enforced in foreign jurisdictions, of course, and this could cause problems in cases where the publishing contract is governed by foreign law. Academic freedom is another thing to take into account. There is an argument that has been put forth that an EU secondary publication right could interfere with researchers right to publish by making publicly funded scientific articles by European um, researchers uncompetitive for publication in leading journals. In principle, however, I would argue that there is no reason to assume that academic freedom means a right to publish in the journal of one's choice, of the author's choice, and moreover, if a journal chooses to reject submissions on the basis of factors other than scientific quality, then arguably that is their choice and perhaps an illustration of the problem with the current publishing model. Ultimately, the study concluded on a set of recommendations with regard specifically to legislative solutions such as the secondary publication right. Um, the public, uh, the, the uh, uh, study suggested that with regard to reuse, one thing that uh, should be considered should be clarifying the scope of the scientific research exception and the quotation exception and making them mandatory for member states. And I would argue that this is an absolute must with regard to access, introducing an EU-wide secondary publication right could be contemplated. I must admit that personally, I have gone back and forth a bit in this regard. I think that the public international um, law implications should be taken very seriously, as should the requirements of the three-step test. In this regard, it's important to emphasize that the secondary publication right only provides access, not rights to reuse, and it does not allow for immediate open access. So in this regard, it's very different to open access mandates and therefore perhaps unideal. This raises the question of whether other solutions can be envisaged, perhaps preferable solutions, but um, to date I don't think that the public debate has reached that far. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I am happy to answer or at least try to answer any questions in the chat um, and I would also be very interested to hear any feedback. Um, thank you. Thank you, Christina, for this uh, very informative um, uh, and, and also um, very complicated part of, uh, uh, of this webinar, but of the whole uh, uh, topic and matter. And I'm really happy that you're trying to make it as clear as possible for us uh, by giving this presentation. Um, uh, 
I'm sure also on this topic there will be uh, questions later on and please if you have any questions put them in the chat you can do that already if you want to we'll uh, monitor and we'll uh, pick them up later, later and ask them to our presenters um, that brings me to our third speaker Robert Kiley Robert is head of strategy at Coalition S, working to accelerate the transition to full and immediate open access. Robert can share his extensive experience of the harmonization of policy with Plan, Plan S. Today, Robert will share with us the role of rights retention in harmonization, zero embargo initiatives, and will represent the funders' perspective in our, in our panel. Um, Robert, please go ahead. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martine, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk with you today. Let me just share my screen. <clears throat> so I've got 10 minutes um, and, and Christina has really sort of set me up quite, quite nicely because we've talked about a lot of the, the uh, legislative, legislative approaches to ensuring research is available, um, open access without embargo, and some of the challenges of that. I'm going to present uh, a slightly different approach, which is based on on, on rights retention. It certainly, is not uh, challenge free, but it um, is like a, a practical um, approach while we wait um, a legislative solution. So, what I want to do in my uh, ten minutes, I set my clock, is do four things. I want to talk about just a little about Plan S very, very briefly. Talk about actual rights retention, was which I would describe as a sort of a practical approach. To deliver an open access in the absence of a of a secondary publishing rights which enabled zero embargo and, and, and reuse. I'll talk about how we've implemented it or how our funders have implemented it and also how institutions have implemented rights, rights retention and talk about some of the, the, the key challenges and but opportunities um, arising from that and then leave you with some conclusions. So just Plan S, I'm not going to get going, this is my slide on Plan S, so it really is just a, a probably the first time, or we believe it's the first time, when a group of, uh, of, of funding organisations and performing organisations have come together around a, a single goal to make um, full and immediate open access a reality. So we've got policy alignment, uh, not just amongst the funders, we're also working very closely with institutions to support the, uh, the transition. Institutions are really important for, for, for two reasons probably many reasons, but at least two. Um, one, obviously, that is uh, where the researchers are typically typically based, the, the funders fund research, but the researchers take place at, at universities. And secondly, universities are the ones with a lot of clout in terms of spending money with publishers. So working very close institutions makes sense. So the rights retention strategy at Coalition S. Um, with Coalition S, we were always fairly agnostic on how a researcher working under that mandate adhered to the um, policy to make their work open access. And we come up with these with these different routes. Um, and the route we're going to talk about this afternoon is one where uh, an author publishes their research or has their research published in a uh, perhaps a subscription journal, um, but wants to make the manuscript of that article, that accepted article, um, publicly available. And we developed something called, which we call the rights retention strategy to enable researchers who did publish in subscription journals, um, we're not party to a read and publish like agreement, we're not paying hybrid open access fees, we're, we're typically publishing a subscription journal, how they could still adhere to their uh, funder mandate. And we took the view, and we still believe this is a, a very sort of key principle, is that the, the author accepted manuscript, and that's the version after peer review, but perhaps before uh, the publisher has, has uh, enhanced it through copy editing, checking things, formatting it, and so forth. But we believe the author accepted manuscript is the intellectual creation of the author, and therefore uh, belongs to them. And really at its heart, the rights retention is really a simple, simple uh, task of asserting that ownership. And what we did within Coalition S was we developed a very simple template, which we encourage our researchers to include in their manuscript to basically notify the publisher that if you consider this manuscript and in the fullness of time, you decide it's, it's worthy of publication in your journal, note 
that I have already informed you that I'm going to make this available um, immediately with an open access license, uh, typically a, a Creative Commons license. And it's that simple. So I want to talk about how we've how we've implemented it. So first thing, we work very closely with with funders to try to ensure that in their grant conditions, which which uh, the researchers or typically the institutions uh, sign up to, to make sure there was language in these grant conditions which required researchers to uh, be able to share their manuscript, no matter what publishing agreement they eventually entered into with a with a publisher. And on the screen here, we've got uh, a couple of examples from, from Welcome and, and UKRI, where it's effectively saying that you will make your work open access and we give you again some templated language to nip you to notify um, publishers of this, this right. As I said, and, and I think Chris, Christina said, it's perfectly legitimate for a publisher to say, I don't really like that condition and not consider the manuscript. But it's not really acceptable to consider that manuscript having been notified that you're going to make that the author's going to make it open access to then downstream try to change that. They have done that, and I'll come to that in a moment. So the first thing we did is funders put some language in their grant conditions. But much, 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 much more useful um, was universities putting it um, developing institutional rights retention policies. And why is that more important? Simply because most funders, when they when they fund Doctor X to rid the world of malaria or whatever, they they don't actually give that grant to Doctor X. They give it to the university of where they're based. So, so the funder has a relationship with the university. The university has a relationship with the author, and the author has a relationship with the publisher. So the funder to publisher relationship is quite distant. Of course, researchers though are employed by their institution and the institutions that are developing institutional rights retention policies, which requires them to, requires their employees, their researchers, to make sure that research is open access, i.e. put in a repository and shared with a, an open access license. This slide here shows about 21 um, universities in the UK which have rights retention policies at the moment. I checked before I came online, there were 22. I saw Chris Banks in the, um, in the chat saying she's added hers. So maybe there's 23 now, I can't quite remember where we've got to. And what's really crucial is that these institutional rights changing policies, a lot of them come with very, very clear legal support. So this is a, a screen grab from the University of Edinburgh where they say, and I paraphrase, but even if publishers start saying, no, 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 you can't, you can't, um, you can't do this. The university is saying, we're giving you notice that if you try and uh, stop stop our researcher from sharing their manuscript, we will take counter action against you. So I think it's um, it's fairly black and white. I think in our mind that authors do have the right and institutions have the right to say this research has to be shared. Publishers can say cannot can decide not to consider that manuscript, but if they do consider that manuscript, and it has we've given notice of that. I think that's that's fairly watertight. We've already mentioned this in passing that instead that this rights retention has, has got broader support, not just from from funders and from institutions, but from, from broadly from government. We've seen stuff from the UNESCO, the, the the G6, and we've already heard reference to the European Council conclusions. Publishers do try to to undermine rights retention. The most common way is using contract law. Uh, to say, well, under under the contract you're signing, you cannot make uh, uh, this work uh, um, open access. They also try to use their workflows, so you can only hit the, the submit button once you agree that you will not share this manuscript under pain of death or whatever clause they add to their submission system. And sometimes they even try and get authors to remove this language. But I think we can see that rights retention is becoming very mainstream. These are two screen grabs. This is Europe PMC. I just did a search for the phrase for the purpose of open access, and that found over 4,000 articles. I looked in dimensions, and you can see in 2023, there's been already 4,000 articles which include the word for open for the purpose of open access. So it is becoming mainstream. And the most important thing is it's working. 
This is a single example. I could have found many, many, many others. This is an article published in the Journal of Immunology. The article on the, the bit you see on the left-hand left side is just the abstract. I don't have access to the to the, the full, full text. It's behind a paywall. There's a free text version, a full author accepted manuscript version in Europe PubMed Central. There are many, many examples. And what I would say is people who worry about the legal implications of this, I'm not aware of a single takedown request. And even a takedown request would be the very first thing a publisher would do before they start instituting legal proceedings. So I think it's it's fairly watertight, this. So what I'll conclude um, in my last minute is we believe rights retention is a practical mechanism by which researchers can always ensure they can comply with their funder, funder, funder policies. In terms of copyright, just telling, informing uh, publishers of the prior license is sufficient to assert that copyright. In terms of contract law, so if you sign something that says, I will not share, and then you share, that sounds like a, a breach, and probably it is. However, if somebody encourages you to breach a contract they know about, that's actually a, 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 an infringement as well, and there's something called tortuous interference of contract. So people can't interfere with other people's contracts. So the fact that the researcher has a contract with the institution or with the funder or with both, and a publisher perhaps tries to undermine that, that's not that's not kosher. None of this has ever come to courts, and I don't believe it ever will, but um, just be aware that there are alternative approaches here. So I'll conclude, and this is my very last, last word, let me stop my timer. Um, of course, rights retention would be completely unnecessary if secondary publishing rights uh, with zero embargo and reuse rights was legislated for and, and sort of was globally adopted. I'm a little bit skeptical that it's going to happen anytime soon and perhaps in my lifetime. So in the absence of this, I think rights retention still has a role to play in delivering full and immediate open access. And I will stop there and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, for um, um, your presentation and uh, the insights from uh, from your side of the spectrum. Uh, and again, we will come back to uh, uh, to you later on. Uh, I'm very happy to see uh, several questions coming up in the chat. So we will get to those later um, uh, after we have listened to Judy and. Um, uh, Judy is Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries. Uh, Judy leads ARL's priority areas of advocacy and public policy and scholars and scholarship with a strong emphasis on open science and open scholarship, including new publishing models and research data sharing. This work is done in partnership with federal agencies, scholarly communities, and peer associations in the United States, Canada, and internationally. And what is interesting to um, uh, this presentation is that we're not only focusing on Europe, but we try to get Judy's experiences with examples and practices from the United States uh, and United States research libraries in a zero embargo environment, preparing for agency policies under the Nelson memo. Judy, please give us your presentation and your thoughts on this topic. Thank you so much. Let's get this going. Okay. Does it look okay? Yes, it does. Okay. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much um, to Leaper for organizing this important discussion. Um, these have been really wonderful presentations. I've learned a lot. Um, my name is, um, was introduced, I'm Judy Rutenberg, and I do serve as Senior Director of Scholarship and Policies at ARL. We are a membership organization of 127 libraries in Canada and the US, um, and I'm here today to um, share experiences with the Nelson Memo primarily among our, our US membership. So the Nelson Memo, uh, is uh, policy guidance from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. 
that called for all government agencies with extramural research and development budgets to develop or update their existing public access policies to make them zero embargo for publications and associated data. So very exciting, welcome policy. Um, it has been over a year since the policy guidance was issued. Many funding agencies have published plans for um, put them out for public comment in advance of their updated policies. And as an association, we have responded to those plans with comments representing our sector. And across ARL libraries and institutions, there has been a ton of discussion about what zero embargo will look like for how publicly funded research is disseminated, made accessible, how much it will cost, and uh, who will pay. So it is now November 2023. We expect completed policy development by the end of next year and implementation by the end of 2025. So in the meantime, I want to talk about how research libraries are engaging with funders and other research stakeholders um, as these policies are being um, updated or developed, how they are working with stakeholders within their institutions to prepare for implementation, and finally, what steps research libraries are taking to realize the full, realize the vision of the full benefit of this memorandum, free, immediate and equitable access to funded research. Um, but first, since this is a webinar primarily about secondary rights, secondary publishing rights, the OSTP policy does not make any attempt to define, change, modify, or otherwise address US copyright law, and ARL is not advocating for a change in copyright law. Rather, the Nelson memo states that the, the states the conditions under which researchers and, um, as Robert pointed out, research institutions can accept federal research funding, which is contract law, specifically the contract, again, between funder and institutions. Authors and libraries, of course, sign contracts with publishers that articulate conditions of access and reuse and are the source of friction that's already been covered in this, um, in this webinar. Um, and my, my colleagues have addressed and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later. So engaging with funders. Since copyright is not since uh, implicated in terms of a change, um, we have consistently recommended the rights retention language um, borrowed from our colleagues at Coalition S. Um, so and including specifying the kind of license that will enable full reuse rights. Um, here are just a couple of other issues that we are um, promoting with respect to publications and as agencies develop policies. Um, one is um, ensuring accessibility for people with print disabilities. And I point this out um, to say, to cl also clarifying that there's no copyright conflict in making works accessible for public access. It's an exception or a limitation. Um, as we've as has been discussed. Um, we've addressed administrative burden, asking agencies to coordinate with each other and with campus units on compliance, since this is an expense. Um, rights retention we discussed, so I want to talk just a little bit about monitoring costs, persistent identifiers, and repositories. The OSTP guidance allows grantees to pay reasonable costs for publication. For, to make works accessible, but the costs are not well understood. And as we do understand them, and particularly as high research producing institutions do the math, individual publication costs do not appear to be sustainable. So we are recommending that agencies in the first instance monitor um, costs, including at the close out of a grant when additional publications come forward um, and monitoring and reviewing publication costs of journal titles in the fields in which their agency funds um, funds research. So um, the idea here is that we would all benefit from better data on how the market is responding to these policies. We recommend the use of open persistent identifiers um, which, as you know, um, the registries together with their underlying metadata make research publications discoverable wherever they're deposits, deposited. So whether these are versions of record or um, green uh, manuscripts in, in repositories um, for articles, people, and institutions, including funding institutions, um, a persistent identifier is um, necessary. Our comments, we also... Um, uh, 
uh, have cited the investments that research libraries have made and are continuing to make in institutional repositories as um, promoting them as viable uh, for agency designated options for author manuscripts. So in any policy environment, um, research libraries succeed when they're in partnership and coordination with their institutional stakeholders. So research offices, faculty, including faculty who are leaders of scholarly societies. So working with institutional uh, stakeholders, in this case, um, we our libraries are coordinating on education and outreach to researchers, making sure that they understand those publishing contracts um, in relation to um, their own uh, open access institutional open access policy should they have one referring um, researchers in a coordinated way to copyright specialists on campus particularly in the library um, helping to navigate publishing options and developing services um, to reduce burden on researchers uh, libraries are educating about or helping to develop institutional open access what robert referred to as institutional rights retention policies um, typically policies passed through faculty governance um, and are the result of enormous kind of coalition building um, on the part of, of libraries and open access champions on campus. Um, many are negotiating transformative or tra uh, transitional agreements, read and publish agreements that bundle subscription and publishing costs, and having many conversations about how to address um, equity issues within those within that environment. But overwhelmingly, I want to suggest that research libraries uh, have been successful in working in partnership with their communities to demonstrate and realize this, that open dissemination of research is part of the cost of doing research. So whether that looks like investment in a repository or transformative agreement or a different kind of, um, uh, different kind of publishing option, this recognition um, is important along with our understanding of what of what costs are in order to um, fully fund this and realize these benefits. So in addition, what other steps are they taking to realize the memo's potential? Um, again, this is kind of part of this part of the solution as we ready for the policies and and um, and uh, ready our own infrastructure, um, connecting scholarly societies with university presses that publish journals, which often, you know, particularly at the end of a commercial publishing contract or instead of a commercial publishing contract, they might look at university presses um, as options for uh, which will yield greater affordability and openness. Um, encouraging models like subscribe to open. Uh, investing in diamond or some are calling no fee um, publications and investing again continuing to invest in repositories and repository networks so about a year ago um, my colleague cynthia hudson vitali and i um, published a report um, it was a survey of our u.s university member expenditures on open access content and infrastructure in support of open scholarship and that report is available on the ARL website. And the point, the reason why I'm um, sort of flagging it here is that this was kind of a moment in time in 2022. We did the survey before the Nelson memo was issued. Um, and this is what the, you know, of uh, this is how the investments dis were distributed. So as, as expenditures in open were distributed, the vast majority was going to uh, read and publish agreements followed by repositories, non-APC based OA publishing models. And this is where you would find kind of um, uh, memberships to DOAJ and PLOS and, and those kinds of um, publishing models, scope three. Um, and I, I, uh, mentioned this, we had done this, uh, we had modeled our survey after a survey done um, by our Canadian colleagues in the um, Canadian Association of Research Libraries, um, with the understanding that we would do this again. And I think it's just a data point that we can look to and see how this all, how this distribution might change um, in the wake of a, a policy environment that we have. So before I close, um, I just want to point out a couple of key resources that kind of address this conflict between copyright law, rights retention policies, and contracts. Um, so I want to shout out to the Authors Alliance, um, authorsalliance.org, which has a wealth of resources to help authors, investigators understand what they're signing, what their options are, particularly with respect to the tactics um, that Robert mentioned. Um, 
And then finally, um, a resource on the that the Association of Research Libraries developed called Know Your Copyrights, knowyourcopyrights.org, to um, help libraries fully exercise their statutory rights um, to ensure that those rights are um, and exceptions um, are uh, well understood by libraries, by Congress, um, by the Copyright Office, and by the court. So my colleague, uh, Catherine Klosek, published a paper on contract preemption or override. Um, and this past spring, uh, ARL co-sponsored a symposium on this topic, which um, I think looking at the list of participants, perhaps some of you um, participated. So that is knowyourcopyrights.org. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Judy, for your um, perspective from the other side of the ocean and very uh, concrete and practical steps that you can take uh, regarding this topic. Um, may I invite all speakers to turn on their uh, cameras again, uh, because we've um, come to the end of the presentations of everyone. And we would like to go to the panel discussion now. And I'm really happy that uh, we can see quite a number of um, questions already in the chat, but please keep them coming and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at them and um, uh, post them to our, our panel. Uh, like I said uh, at the beginning, Martina, Matthias Bjornman will leave us in five minutes. Uh, and of course, we would be really happy to hear his thoughts after the presentations. Um, so Matthias, could you give us some reflections on the, on the presentations that you uh, just heard from your colleagues? And maybe also from your perspective, it's interesting to see um, or to hear a little bit more on the big changes that we saw recently at the EU level uh, earlier this year, mainly under the president uh, presidency of the Swedish uh, uh, government. Um, uh, could you could you um, elaborate a little bit uh, more on the impact of those, maybe? <clears throat> thank you, Martino, and thank you to the colleagues who gave the presentations. I think that's a very good summary of a complex legal landscape in one hand, but also quite, if I may say so, morally quite clear what the right path forward is uh, conceptually. Uh, I, I wanted to pick up, Martin, the, there was one question here, which I think is a really interesting one, a really important one, that wasn't a, a 20 minutes or so now, around how can we avoid that winning a policy victory at the EU level as a, is a more of a Pyrrhic victory almost, that they have many carve outs and limitations that it reality it doesn't provide a lot of benefit as we would hope. And this is from Joshua Shelley that shared this. And from my perspective, this is from the advocacy or even lobbying perspective in and around Brussels. This is always a challenge when we engage on these type of topics that uh, uh, there may be other actors who are not aligned with our, our with our view, and we know in this case that there are certain players that are quite deep pockets and can put in quite substantial uh, resources. This is what happened during the Swedish presidency. I know there were strong attempts to dilute the text and basically make the text a lot weaker, the council conclusions that were adopted. I'm happy that a bunch of us, the other stakeholders who are in favor of this, work together with the presidency and with the member states to ensure they could keep a quite strong wording. So this is what makes me hopeful that we can work together with the co-legislators here, so the European Parliament and the Council and the member states, to ensure that any victory, if we want to use those words in the policy terms, would not be a Pyrrhic one, but would actually have a real uh, impact. But True, there is nothing we can do, say or do now to promise or say that there will not be challenges or that it's a guaranteed outcome, so to speak. And this is we need to work closely with our legal partners, legal friends and those that have expertise in this area. Some of those who presented today and are with us here today. So uh, I'm also very happy to all, all the time when I'm engaging on this topic, learn more about the legal landscape also globally and how this has been evolving over many years and the different ways of approaching this that can help us to make sure we have a complete understanding and not allow for loopholes or similar uh, carve outs or other wordings that have been used. I didn't fully answer your question, Martin, but I did reflect a little bit on here and how we have been evolving. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you so much, Matthias. And um, um, if we're in the middle of a discussion, thank you so much for your uh, participation to this webinar, if you have to leave. Um, I saw another question in the chat coming from Brian Selman, a question uh, initially for Robert, but maybe um, um, one of our other panelists may have some ideas on this as well. The question is, isn't there a fourth publisher strategy against uh, rights retention, which is to automatically charge anything submitted in that way, an APC, um, Springer, whatever ACS is doing? Can we reasonably expect to see this more? And there's uh, quite a, a number of answers on that or responses on that in the chat. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this, Robert? Um, I haven't I haven't seen the questions, so I haven't seen the answers. So perhaps I should look at the the chat before I try and try and answer. So if I understood it correctly. You 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 as an author, you log on submission system. You 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 hit submit. You you've included the egregious language that you're going to share the manuscript, and by the magic of of workflow, you are presented with a like a PayPal screen or something. Um, well, I suppose in reality, if that if that that sounds like a a, a a fairly um you know it sounds like a strategy publishers will employ um so i think the author has 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 two choices there really i mean one choice really doesn't it you just go to a different if you really if the if the author doesn't like the policy of that publisher um then don't hit the submit button close the browser window and find another publisher which does not so very easy for me to to, to, to say that um but if the workflow is such that you can't get through that, then then I think your only weapon is take your manuscript elsewhere. And if if researchers you know did that more, then publishers would probably change their uh, approach. Probably is a completely symbiotic relationship, and it's what I've been in this sort of open access stuff for for too long. Apologies, but it always strikes me that it is symbiotic. Um, but researchers often see themselves as the weaker party. Publishers have absolutely nothing without your content. Um, your content is what gives them value. So if you genuinely believe that that the 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 the, the, the model they use in the ethics, their values are not aligned with yours, take your manuscript elsewhere. There are many many other publishers out there. I'm not sure if that answers it, but I think the answer is yes. It is a strategy which publishers employ, and and the only way around it is to take your manuscript elsewhere. But I haven't seen the other answers, which are probably far more um, arable. OK, thank you, Robert. Christina, you would like to respond? Yes. So I thought I'd first respond to the first question that Matthias pulled out of the chat, the one by Joshua Shelley, with regard to a potential political policy victory at EU level if a secondary publication right is adopted. Um, and I think I think that is a very, very valid um, concern. Um, and um, Joshua also points out essentially that this is something that happened in Germany. So Germany was the first country in the EU to adopt a secondary publication right. Um, I have um, followed to some extent uh, ex post as as I was writing the study, I went back a decade to sort of look into the pol political debate in Germany in, in uh, the lineup to the adoption of the secondary publication, right? And it was very controversial. And it was very controversial for political reasons, policy reasons, but also for legal reasons. And I think that's why the secondary publication right has ended up being the way it is right now. So Joshua makes reference to um, the limitation to federally funded scholarly research. I mean, any iteration I've seen of the secondary publication right, including um, Lieber's proposal, has been limited to publicly funded um, scientific research, because I think that sort of is the type of research that gives the incentive to sort of say, well, this amounts to an appropriation of public funds, and you can't do that. In Germany, there's been a bit of a debate as to whether that would also cover uh, research that is produced by universities, right? Are universities, are researchers employed by universities? Are they publicly funded? And that's an important question. 
question in itself. I think there is scope to sort of try to push, and we've seen that push in Germany, um, to sort of push and say, actually, this type of research should be covered because it is publicly funded research. And that's the policy question there. But then the second question, the question of embargoes is far trickier, because all iterations of the secondary publication right do have something between a six month and a one year embargo period. There is no zero embargo secondary publication right. And I think that goes back to what I was uh, pointing out in my presentation, which is that the secondary publication right, although it's called a right, behaves a lot like an exception and limitation. And that brings in the three step test, which governs ex exceptions and limitations at the international level. And it's also been adopted into EU copyright law. And um, the three-step test essentially for reasons that are complicated and I'm not going to get into right now but essentially as best as I can tell and it's very vague legal language that is very hard to interpret but it would be hard to argue that a second that a zero embargo secondary publication right is compatible with the three-step test so this is uh, one of my main hesitations with the secondary publication right I think it's great I think it's amazing I think if it would be adopted perhaps it would be a small part of the puzzle but I don't see a secondary publication right being adopted that does away with rights retention strategies like of the type that uh, Robert earlier said would, if we had that, then we wouldn't need rights retention strategies. I think what's much more likely is that all of these tiny pieces of the puzzle come together to create sort of a flow and a, and a movement, hopefully in the right direction. And then with regard to what Robert was just saying about, you know, just don't click the button, find another, uh, find another publisher. As a researcher myself, I know how difficult that is to do, but I think that goes back to actions outside of the law to sort of change the publication, the research publication culture and change how researchers are assessed, how we value, um, uh, what we value in researcher output and how we assess good quality research. So I think that's something that has to happen. That has to be a change of values within the academic community. And that's easier said than done. But I think, again, that is an essential building block, an essential part of the process. Okay, thank you. Um, large questions, large answers. We're not there yet uh, so far. Um, that of course brings us to uh, to the question then what, how can we take further steps to actually uh, work on these, all these little building blocks? Um, um, could one of you um, explore that? way what what could be next steps uh, instead of um, changing the whole research culture within the next few months which is uh, way too much uh, Christina could you uh, give some ideas there from a legal legal perspective maybe so maybe if I tie that to one of the questions I see in the chat now, which is um, by Ross uh, Mounts, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I thought that the Spanish had a zero day secondary public, uh, uh, publication right. Um, so the Spanish law came out after I published my study and I haven't had the chance to research it in detail and I don't speak Spanish. So, uh, and I, I'm not aware of much other secondary research on the Spanish um, on the Spanish solution. But the way I understand the Spanish solution at the moment is actually not a right at all. It's an obligation. And there is a huge difference from a legal perspective between the two. So researchers have publicly funded, um, it, it's more like uh, the institutional rights retention strategy approach. Researchers have publicly funded um, uh, publicly funded researchers have an obligation to publish things in open access. Now, nothing is said, therefore, of whether once they publish something with a private publisher, they have a right to then make available online afterwards. So that's something entirely different. And perhaps that's a better solution. Perhaps that gets around the problems that are posed by the secondary publication right. Robert, would you like to add something to that? Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, yeah, well, I quite like the idea of a secondary publication obligation. Maybe that's what we should be um, lobbying for rather than the, uh, an SPR. Um, I you know, go back to the, the main question. I don't there, uh, you know, I don't think there are any any easy answers here. I mean, you said we 
going to can't change research culture in six months and absolutely we, we can't change it in six months and they argue been trying to change it i don't know for many years i mean dora i remember when i was at welcome we were one of the first um, funders to get behind the, the san francisco declaration on research assessment that was in 2012 when i left welcome about a, a decade later despite the fact that had been in our sort of policies and um, grant reviewing committees were always and the chair of grant reviewing committees always sort of sat down at the start of the meeting and said when we're assessing these grant applications we're looking at the, the you know the, the value of what the research has done their ability to deliver this and we're not going to look at journal names and, and things like that the research community generally didn't believe us and still really holds that holds dear that that, that the fact that the value is the, the journal name and the, and its impact factor so i do think we have to we have to try and change that that culture i am a bit more optimistic now than i than i was um a few years back i think we're seeing initiatives like koara in, in europe and um helios in the united states which are really trying to uh, change research culture and i will use this as a as an advertising opportunity the Co we in coalition s have just published a new proposal around sort of what a future scholarly publication system you know should aspire to should look like perhaps and in there we talk about the the value of of peer review and it seems i mean it's slightly tangential to the secondary publishing right institute but it does seem that we will need ways we being whether they're tenure you know tenure promotion committees or grant reviewing committees we always need ways to help assess the people who are applying for promotion or, or, or grants. And if we're not going to use journal names to impact factors, which are obviously massively flawed, we need something. And we have this fantastic resource of peer review and of peer review of literature. And at the moment, though, that peer review is primarily used to inform a yes, no decision. Should we publish this? Yes or no? It doesn't matter how good that peer review report is. It's just informing that, that binary decision. And that value is just completely lost. And imagine in a world where those peer review reports were open, they didn't necessarily be signed, had different views on whether reviews should be signed. But if they were open and you were a committee and you're looking at a grant applicant, you've suddenly got access to what other experts think of that. So I do think we've got to change the culture. It's not going to be uh, immediate. It's going to take a long time. In the, in the short term, continue to... Um, use rights retention. If publishers force you down a particular submission path where you can't use rights retention, you've got to hand over your credit card before you can hit submit, then take your manuscript elsewhere. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the questions that I saw earlier was if, um, I think it was the question if uh, Coalition S was going to cover for for uh, uh, to cover researchers uh, who uh, are a bit hesitant now to uh, to actually take their publication somewhere else. Um, how can we overcome, or how can researchers overcome that hesitance uh, to to you know not really knowing what to do in this respect? So on an indi individual level, what possibilities do researchers have to take a next step to do this uh, knowing that you know it's very easy when you say Robert uh, just take your article and bring it somewhere else and at the same time we don't see everyone doing that so uh, what could help Judy from a very uh, from your perspective could you could you give some hints uh, what could help researchers to do it actually I mean, that is a great question. So knowing that changing research culture is a you know sort of generational work, it's not um, you know, not not fast. Um, I do think this is where the importance of that institutional coalition is. So it isn't, you know, and and just and continuing to understand as sort of keep the institutional coalition together. So, you know, to understand the costs, understand that. Um, just as we just as we promote in open science broadly, that it's not that you do your research in a very closed environment and then have a you know a publication at the end point. The whole point of open science is to sort of open that process, right? So, I think the other piece is to understand that that um, 
publishing, making reusable, making accessible um, research is, is part of the cost of doing it. And so I think, um, you know, so this is where it lands on an institution and a funder, you know, and as a negotiation, is, is anyone going to pay this? So, you know, I saw in the chat people saying institutions should refuse to pay. Some certainly are. Um, some and certain will also refuse to pay um, publication charges, you know, a APCs in general. So um, I think that um, another piece of the dynamic that I referenced but didn't really get into so much is this um, question of scholarly societies, which are so involved in advocacy for the funding of science itself. And so, and, and, and yet the dynamics of the publishing of society publishing and libraries are complicated, but this is, they are an important piece of the, of the coalition um, in order to understand how research funding can be maximized to do the research and to disseminate it openly. It's a very hard question. That's the, <laughs> that's my answer. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other um, uh, um, steps that 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 can be taken, either on a European or national or institutional or individual level, uh, that we can see? Um, Christina, uh, you were talking about ex exceptions and limitations, and um, even though there are these exceptions and limitations uh, for researchers to to do share their works. Um, what can be be done to overcome barriers, legal barriers? What do you see in this respect? Um, so that's a good question. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to consider is whether exceptions and limitations can be used to essentially read a secondary publication right, perhaps even a secondary publication right, with no embargo and with all of the things that we want it to have into current copyright legislation. So perhaps you could say that if we have a research exception, that research exception should be interpreted to allow the provision of access, because that's exactly what exclusive rights govern. They don't govern access from the user. The user's accessing work, like accessing infringing works has never been something that copyright has been concerned with. It has been the provision of access, right? So what the author would be doing by taking advantage of their secondary publication, right? So perhaps we can say that if you have a research exception, then anything that you do that is labeled a reuse, essentially an action that is done without the permission of the copyright owner, the publisher, right? Um, so, um, yeah, um, sorry, I'm distracted by the chat. Then, then, then that, um, could um, it, it could be interpreted to be able to give other people access to my work because the reason why I do the work is in order to uh, uh, to, to 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 distribute it and and promote science and perhaps there should be a general exception um, to scientific works from copyright that doesn't allow third parties even with the copyright to come in and try to exploit it for um, for reasons that are more let's say base more about money making rather than the more high minded sort of ideas of the promotion of science and so forth. I think then again, you'd run into issues with exceptions and limitations um, and, and the three step tests. So that's a problem. It certainly wouldn't fly under current interpretations of the research exception in those countries where it exists, but perhaps the EU exception could be reformulated in that way. Um, another potential solution, and this has been suggested, this has been suggested like completely seriously, especially um, in the US, um, there has been, there have been suggestions that copyright is inappropriate for scientific research, and therefore we should just simply not be protecting these works with copyright. That's interesting, but I don't see a way to do that given the international copyright framework. I, I do like this sort of idea of not talking about a secondary publication rank, but talking about a, an obligation. I think I think that might work. One of the um, solutions that I sort of explored in the report, incidentally, very secondarily, was could the copyright go to the institution rather than the researcher, which is not unprecedented because employers often in many countries have the copyright. 
And then could the institution be bound in a way to introduce rights retention strategies? So essentially say the only person that gets to decide where to publish is the author and it can't be exploited. So we have the copyright and we are curators, protectors of the responsible management of the copyright. But I think perhaps the obligation solution would be even more intriguing because that way you cut it off from the beginning. You simply don't give people the right to grant these their copyright to the publishers. Um, which brings me, if that's okay, to a right I have for Robert. Because when I was looking into Plan, uh, sorry, a question I have for Robert, <laughs> sorry. Because when I was looking into Plan S, one of the things, and I don't know if the discussion has moved on since then, potentially. So one of the things I was looking into was prior license and prior obligations. So there were ways in which to bind researchers and some apparently institutions took a prior license approach, which was essentially that the moment the grant is given, the researcher is in advance licensing under a CC by license or whatever license was preferred by the, by, by, by the funder, all of the future research outputs um, or a prior obligation, that is to say an obligation to license any future, um, a, a, any, any, any future outputs as a result of the public funding of the, of the funding of the research. And have you, are you aware of this distinction and have you encountered any sort of differences in practice or any differences in legal implications between these two approaches? So, and, and Martin will be familiar with this, with any sort of membership organization, you have, um, you have a broad church of, of, of members and, and not all members all agree at all times, no matter how much we may pretend or wish that was the case. So you're right that there are uh, sort of two approaches within rights retention. Um, there's the, there's the, the prior license, which I've been talking about a lot today, and, and the prior obligation. Uh, I think generally we, we think the prior licenses are much, much more um, robust and okay. practical way in which you can you can deliver on that. I mean, the obligation, the obligation's always been there, but it doesn't mean anyone, um, doesn't mean the publishers are going to abide by it. You just say, oh, I'm obliged to make this open access. Good luck with that. So I think we we generally feel that the prior license is a much more robust approach because it's a very practical way of, of a, an author uh, threatening to, or rather just informing the publisher that, if you decide to do something with this manuscript and eventually you decide it's worthy of publication, I've already told you that I am going to make it available under uh, an open license. So we think that is a, a sort of a, a, a more robust approach. And just in terms of Martin's sort of more, more general question, we focus, I, I focus a lot on my answer about, well, what happens if the publishers like force you down this route where you have to get your credit card out before you hit submit? And of course that will grow. And maybe it'll become the dominant but that is not the current model for every single submission system most submission systems still you know you go and you submit your manuscript and so forth and all i would say is that we i think we launched the rights retention thing back in about i don't know 2021 i'm struggling to remember the dates now whatever whenever it was two or three years ago we have not been made aware of a single takedown request and as i showed you with those screenshots from um, Europe PMC and, and dimensions this is becoming it's not like a, a real sort of um, niche activity it's becoming fairly mainstream you know I think I found there was about 9,000 articles or something in 2023 so far which include this this language now obviously that's not, not massive but it's still it's still more than it's not niche and I think the point is a publisher to my knowledge has never even issued a takedown notice and a takedown notice would be the first step. Can you please remove that manuscript? And therefore, absolutely confident that a publisher has never taken action against either a repository for having a manuscript available or the author or the institution. So I think a lot of this is based on sort of what in the UK we're very familiar with this idea of Project Fear and the idea that when you find a contract, you can't, you, 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 you're not allowed to share this now. Well, you can still share it. And actually, because you've given prior notice, and as I say, there has been no 
to my knowledge, and if someone wants to contradict me, please, please do. No, none that I have any takedown notices or any action taken by a publisher, despite the fact that many, many thousands of articles are now available, which hitherto would have been potentially behind a paywall. Well, that is reassuring. Uh, at the other uh, hand, do we want to pose that um, responsibility on the shoulders of a single researcher or should other steps be taken uh, given the report? There are seven countries. Uh, Christina, you're talking about five countries that have um, uh, secondary pu publishing right or similar uh, policies on, on a national level. And also institutionally, we do see progress, but not all institutions have similar policies in place. So who should take, who, who should be uh, the actor of taking charge of this process? What do you think? Um, well, I, I, I think it's a, it's a joint responsibility between sort of like the, between the funders, the institutions and the, and the researchers, they, they need to work, work, work together to in, in, ensure that, you know, if a funder, funder has a policy which requires work to be made open access. That obligation, that requirement is sort of inherited by the institution, which takes the money off that funder, and by the researcher, which then carries out that, that research. So there is an obligation. If you if you you know you take the money, you take the condition. So they need to work together to um to deliver that. So uh yeah, they need to that, that's the I think that's the only answer I've got to that. And in terms of if there's any Often this is presented, but like the authors in the the authors on the hook, um, I think I think the likelihood of a publisher going after an author is infinitesimally small. The the PR disaster for that would be absolutely enormous. But even if that even if that happens, the institution has to make clear that they will support that author. And I think I had a screenshot showing um, what they did, at, for example, at Edinburgh University. Where they've made it absolutely clear that they are ready if a publisher tries to take action against a researcher having that researcher having notified the publisher in advance they're going to share this manuscript that they will take a counter action so i don't think the author's in the middle authors often present as being in the middle but they are um they are typically employed at an institution that institution is the one which should provide legal and 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 moral support and are doing so Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that is a beautiful conclusion of this webinar where we explored several ways of um, what can be done to take next steps in um, um, bringing research outputs, open access immediately avail available for reuse. Um, a very hopeful one, uh, if I may conclude with, uh, it's all about guts. Uh, and uh, finding ways uh, to make it happen and at the same time keep uh, collaborating together uh, to to make the big steps and make uh, make uh, big steps happen in Europe and the wider world. Um, well, having said that, uh, I still see some some comments coming uh, coming in uh, the chat, but I would like to conclude with first of all, thank all the speakers for their excellent contributions today. I think uh, I speak for many when I say that it was a pleasure to hear your thoughts and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities in harmonizing or at least taking further steps, um, uh, zero embargo uh, initiatives. And thank you for the lively discussion. We very much appreciated your time, your invested and uh, make this webinar a success. And also uh, um, a very huge thank you to all the attendees of this webinar for your attention and questions that sparked the discussion. Uh, also, your input was very valuable source for the success of this, uh, this webinar. And lastly, I would like to bring uh, to your attention two reports brought forth on the Knowledge Rights 21 project, the aforementioned report, Secondary Publishing Rights in Europe, uh, and secondly, a, a report issued by Spark Europe, Opening Knowledge, Retaining Rights and Opening Licen Licensing in Europe 2023. And both the links to those reports will be shared in the chat as well. Well, 
this leaves me with wishing you all an enjoyable evening or a good day for some of you seeing in the chat and Judy from the other side of, uh, of the world, uh, looking from Europe at least, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you. And thank you on behalf of Lieber and KR21. And we hope to see you again soon. A good evening to all of you.